Okay, you have seen that the cloud lecture was stopped because they want to keep on time and start this lecture, which is more on computing cloud, or, well, more general on uh, what are current uh, trends and in general worries uh, in terms of computer security, internet privacy. Uh, so this is what I want to share with you. My name, my name is Sebastian Lopinski. I come from Poland. I'm here working at CERN uh, on computer security. Uh, and I want to sh kind of share with you what, what we consider, or, okay, so that's kind of my point of view, not necessarily that of CERN, but what I consider are currently uh, situation in terms of computer security, how secure are we, how much should we be worried about our privacy. So let's start. Let's maybe start with a cloud hack. Now by cloud, we don't mean physical clouds in the sky, we mean a computing cloud. Uh, so the kind of trend to keep data and uh, information and computing uh, power, not on your local computers or local devices, but rather somewhere in some kind of infrastructure, remote infrastructure. There was a case from last year, which I think is actually very interesting because we will go into some details of that, um, when a digital life of a journalist, of a wired uh, magazine journalist, so a journalist which specializes in technologies, uh, his digital life was destroyed virtually within a you know, very short time. And by that I mean that his accounts to Amazon, to Google, to Twitter, to Apple were compromised, so he lost access to his own accounts, which means email, which means a lot of things. And you know that right now Apple devices, uh, you can, uh, if you have some Apple devices and Apple account, if you lose your iPhone or Mac or whatever, you can erase it remotely, so wipe out remotely. And this is what attackers did with his devices. So all of a sudden, all his you know, computers and portable devices were, all the data was lost, including pictures of his daughter since she was born. So you know, all of a sudden you start to realize that you, or people, or like this gentleman, keep a lot of value and a lot of data in, uh, in a cloud, and they trust the services a lot. And then you start wondering, so how is it possible? How, you know, was it an a advanced attack? Was it something uh, very, very tricky, very technical to perform? Was the, were the attackers very, uh, you know, advanced in, you know, hacking some, some things? Well, let's see into detail. So how would you hack into, this guy is called Matt, so how would you hack into Matt's accounts? Well, first you would call Amazon and say, I want to add a new, I'm Matt, I want to add a new credit card. And for that, Amazon will ask you, what's your name, billing address, and email address? So I guess you would probably agree with me that these pieces of information are not necessarily uh, very secret. I mean, if you know someone or if you want to find out about someone, uh, you know, these three pieces of information, it's easy. Okay, so attackers called Amazon and added a new credit card. Why? Well, because then they call again and they say, excuse me, I'm Matt, but I lost my password, and I want to add a new email address which would be related to this Amazon account. And now what uh, Amazon asks you know, the attackers over the phone is, okay, could you give me your name, billing address, and current credit card? Well, but the attackers just provided the credit card, right, before. So the attackers do have all this information, which means they could register in this Amazon account another email address and, uh, well, get so what they do then is they basically go to Amazon.com and set reset password. And this new password to Amazon account is sent to this email address that the attacker has just provided. Right? So not to Matt, the journalist email address, but to the new email address. Which means at this moment, the attackers do have full control over the Amazon account, Amazon account of, this, of this poor guy. Fine. Then what happens is that... Uh, they log into his Amazon account, because they have a password now, and they can see all the credit cards numbers. Not only the last one that they added, but all the previous credit card numbers. Well, not full numbers, just last four digits. But it turns out that those last four digits is exactly what you need to call Apple and say, hello, I'm Matt, I lost my password, uh, could you give me a new one? And he, what you need there is your name, your billing address, and last four digits of a credit card. Right? All of a sudden you see that you know, some information that Amazon considers n fine to reveal for last digits of a credit card number is something that Apple believes is enough to authenticate you. Right? Or, 
Okay, so they get access to, uh, you know, Amazon uh, Apple account because they get a new temporary password. And then they go to Google and they say, uh, deal, you know, on, on the web page, deal Google, I lost my password, could you send me a new one? And this new one is being sent to an Apple email address because that's how this Google account was configured. So now the attacker have the Google password to the, account, to the Google account of this guy. And then they do exactly the same for, for Twitter. They go to Twitter and they say, Res please reset password, I forgot my password. And the new password is being sent to Google account because it so happens that basically the secondary email address of a Twitter account is the Google email. And the Google was already compromised to taken over by attackers. So all of a sudden you see that the fact that all those accounts are interlinked, in a way it's a, it's a problem. It's a, it's a security hole. It's a, it's a vulnerability. Uh, and in a way, the interesting thing here is that actually the Twitter account was a target of attackers. So attackers wanted to get access to the Twitter account of the journalist to be able to post you know, something in his name. But in the process of you know, getting to his Twitter account, they got over all the other things. You know, they wiped out his Apple devices and so on. Another conclusion for me is that it's kind of worrying and maybe surprising to see how weak are those identity checks, right? Is it enough to provide your, you know, almost basic information to get access to someone's account? I mean, billing address and email address are not secret information, right? At all. Okay, granted, those particular holes in, you know, Amazon and Apple's uh, identity checks are now solved. They, they did something else. But I'm personally not, conv I, I don't know details, but I, you know, next month or next year, another attack like this could easily be, you know, pro take, take place. Uh, and in general, it's quite often you see that uh, to even to res if you reset a password or if you create a new account in some, ser some service, they ask you to provide, um, to choose a so-called security question, like what's your uh, grandma made, maiden name or what were, you know, this kind of stuff, and you just provide it. And again, is this secret? Well, let's look at this, uh, you know, this uh, cartoon where there's the, the little boy goes a dog and the father says, you can call her whatever you want, but please remember, it's something you can, well, please make sure you, it's something you can remember because you will be using that name as your security question answer for the rest of your life. <laughs> and this is true. You may remember a case of Sarah Palin, so a U.S. Republican candidate in uh, 2008, I guess, or, well, a couple of years ago. So her, her Yahoo email account was compromised, uh, you know, of a high-level politician uh, because the security question that was protecting that Yahoo you know, account, was where did you meet your husband? I mean, for a public person, it's trivial to find this piece of information, right? The whole idea of security questions is, is flawed, I would say. Uh, one interesting piece of you know, research that was done in this area is that people actually value their accounts, email accounts, more than their e-banking accounts, which, in a way, if you look at this case of this journalist, it makes sense because your email account all of a sudden is a way for many of your digital kind of life, digital resources that you own or you have. Uh, so it's, it's, in a way, you understand why people value it. On the other hand, e-banking account, your e-banking account is direct access to your money. And yet, somehow people, you know, believe that they, well, they, it's more important for them to make sure that their email account is, uh, is not compromised. Interesting. Maybe they believe that if their e-banking account is hacked, the bank will reimburse them money. I don't know. And maybe it's true or not. I don't know either. And in terms of, you know, getting access to someone else's accounts, even if all the services are, in, you know, those identity checks when you call Amazon and say, I'm this and that person, could you reset my password? Even if this is strong, well, people still use very weak passwords. Let's see what are the top 10 words that are using passwords. Uh, well, first one is obviously password. Right? Okay, those are words, so maybe it's password one or password 2003 or whatever. I mean, there's quite often numbers added to the end or beginning or whatever. Second word is welcome. QWERT, so you know, the things that you see on your keyboard. It's easy to remember, right? Easy to type. Uh, monkey. Now, there are some words which maybe actually are interesting to see what people are, you know, consider important words in their lives. So, Jesus, love, money, freedom, Ninja? <laughs> Don't ask me why. Writer. And this means that even if services are, are well protected, 
uh, cloud computing services, you know, online uh, things that we use. Well, if people still, and this is extremely common, I mean, even 2013, this is what you see, you know, like any random service, if there is a password leak, then big percentage, like 30 or 40 percent of passwords are very basic, very easy to guess. This is worrying. Okay, so this is, was kind of an introduction to show where we are, and I would like to more go now, like indeed, where we are in terms of computer security. Uh, who are then people who are behind those attacks or activities that we observe? And what is ahead? Try to predict a little bit the trends and where we will be in a few years. So this is what I'm saying. I could have said like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Unfortunately, it's still true. Software is vulnerable. All those things that you see here, those are either email, uh, sorry, bro uh, web browsers or maybe plugins like Java, PDF, uh, Adobe, Flash, whatever. Uh, so plugins to web browsers, they are repeatedly and repeatedly vulnerable, which means they have security holes uh, which make computers of people basically wide open to attacks. And the attackers, okay, there are many ways how computers are infected, but two major ways are the two major uh, kind of the things that people do with computers. What do you do? You email and you browse the web, right? And this is exactly how people attack, well, attackers, criminals attack computers. Uh, it's uh, either sending you some, some attachments, which you open, maybe a PDF, and this is, you know, there are all the time, or, well, over the last year, there were many and many vulnerabilities in the PDF Acrobat Reader. And or uh, you visit a web page, either you follow a link from a mail or you just visit any random web page that you normally visit, legitimate web page. But it was just infected before by hackers and then it does, and the same web page then infects every visitor that uh, visits uh, the web page. Well, at least every visitor who has at least one of those holes. Now, so of course the good defense is to, to protect your computers, uh, to update your software, so operating system and browsers. Right? But also, all the things, all the plugins that work in your browser. So again, Java, PDF, Flash, and so on. But we can only protect our computers against attacks or, against, or to close security holes that we know about or that you know, producers of those software know about. Now, if there is a vulnerability that someone discovered, uh, a security researcher discovered a vulnerability, let's say, in, in Java, but he doesn't inform well, Oracle now runs Java. He doesn't inform Oracle, but he just sells this information to criminals. Well, Oracle will not know about it and will not be able to solve, to, to fix this, this, this problem. And will not, we will not, as users, will not be able to update our computers, but criminals will be exploiting that security hole. And this is what happens. So there is a clear kind of trend in uh, what happens with the results of security research. There are people who spend time either because of you know, interest to find, try to find vulnerabilities or even, or maybe because of motivation they want to sell it later. And people do find vulnerabilities in software. And this is, by the way, not a crime to, to research. You know, if you have a piece of software, you just look if, if it works as, as foreseen. Even selling this information is not a crime. But then criminals or, uh, well, other people will come to that, buy this information. They don't need technical knowledge. They just need money. And they, well, then do various things with it. I'll come to that as well. So here's, for example, a screenshot. This actually was a video. So researcher found, someone, someone found or claims he found uh, some cross-site scripting, doesn't matter, some vulnerability in Yahoo mail system. So he makes a video of it to kind of prove it. And then he publishes this video and he says, you know, I will sell you details for $700. This is not much. I mean, if you want to attack someone or if you want, want to attack thousands of people, right? Or there's someone else who was trying to sell uh, some vulnerability in Microsoft Office for $20,000. Again, even this is, you may say, okay, this is quite a lot of money, and it is. Now, this is non-unusual. I mean, this, those are usual prices, because if you think that then with this vulnerability you could infect millions of people, and then do, well, get money somehow from infecting millions of people, then it pays off. Because the result is that uh, criminals, basically they infect computers, Millions of computers, uh, for example, this map of Europe, of just one botnet, so one network of comp infected computers. And there's literally millions of, uh, like a botnet of a million or 10 millions of machines is not unusual. Um, 
And then, okay, then uh, we'll see what, what they try to do with it. But this is already very worrying. I wonder if my computer is here. So who are, who are the people who are actually, well, exploiting those vulnerabilities? I would split them by motivation. Because this is, you know, why do they do it is probably the main, main, well, interesting point and main reason why we would differentiate them. So obviously there are criminals who will be simply uh, motivated by, by profit, but gain, getting money. Uh, we, yeah, we don't really have any more uh, hacker. Well, we do, but this is not a big group of hackers that would just hack to show off and to say, well, I hack this and that and so on. It exists, but it's not the main, you know. So, the, you know, if people hack, they usually hack for money and you know, criminals. Or there are hacktivists who, ha who, who hack or who infect things or who you know, take over systems or who, who attack websites, maybe of com companies, because of ideological reasons, because of ideology, of revenge, and so on. And this may be a bit surprising for you, but for me, governments are on this list. And then I'm not saying that what they do is bad or good, but I'm just saying they do exploit vulnerabilities in software. They do buy. Uh, information about security research. Uh, why? Because they want to control computers, because they want to know what people, you know, how people communicate over internet and so on. So let's see a bit more. So criminals, I will not go into details, but this is a usual thing. So they send spam, they do use those infected computers, like maybe my home computer, well, hopefully not, but to attack other services. Uh, they want to maybe, as soon as I will log in from my computer to e-banking, they will want to take over my e-banking session and actually, you know, just transfer some money from my account to somewhere else. Or maybe steal my credit card numbers if, when I type them to, to any website. Uh, or maybe steal information about myself to do identity theft, to maybe take a loan on my name. So, well, worrying thing, unfortunately, well, fairly usual things. One example is, for example, here is a screenshot. So if your computer is infected, you may see something like this. Don't try to read everything, but it in general it says, your computer is locked, and then you were caught downloading or distributing audio or video files protected by copyright law. So you were a pirate, that's what it says. And it basically it says uh, it's related to the Stop Online Privacy Act, so SOPA Act. Now, SOPA Act was never passed in the Congress, right? So it's not a valid you know, legal document, but it's still good to scare people. Because, of, or of course, it's a fake warning. This just is you know, criminals who want to scare you and who want to say, if you don't pay us the fine of, within 72 hours, a fine of $200, your computer will be erased. Well, especially if you just pirated something, and people do, uh, you may get scared, you may trust, you actually believe it, and you may want to pay to kind of get rid of the problem. And uh, well, you know, so there are some estimates how much criminals make money out of it. So even like an average botnet would maybe have maybe 6,000 machines compromised every day. And even if 3% of those people um, actually pay, this makes $30,000 daily income and 400,000 monthly income. And this is huge money if you think of it. Right? Well, I'm not advertising this for you to do, but uh, this is quite impressive. It pays off, unfortunately, for criminals. Uh, so there are regular guys. This is one, one guy that was arrested at Thai airport uh, from FBI wanted list as a cyber criminal. Uh, some of them even show off and, you know, look, I have a nice car. I, you know, they try to pose as gangster, modern gangster, gangsters. Um, they try to employ people who would help them transfer the money. So this is an advertisement. Uh, to become a mule, so basically the trans if you are a mule, the money would be transferred to you, you take a small percentage and then you transfer the money somewhere else. That's just to make the, the transfer from the victim to the criminal a bit more, you know, passing through several, you know, harder to follow by, by law enforcement agencies. This particular advertisement says, join us and become a foreign agent in the US. So, you know, it sells it as something cool. You will be this guy with there's some police, some, you know, bank and so on. So, you know, there's even graphic design just for that. Okay, then we have hacktivists, and they attack either to protest or to pass the message or to do revenge. One example was in uh, when uh, WikiLeaks, well, all the transfers, like if people wanted to support WikiLeaks with money, uh, then US government wanted to stop it and uh, kind of asked or 
yeah, asked MasterCard to stop tra any transfer to WikiLeaks, then attackers, the hacktivists, some of them from a group Anonymous, were attacking MasterCard for a revenge. I'm not saying if it's good or bad. Well, certainly it's against the, against the law. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, there are different kinds of people. So some of them are you know, more criminals. Uh, some of them are really ideologists. There's another example of this guy who already when he was very young, he was uh, helping develop some internet protocols, um, working with Tim Berners-Lee, so the person, the, the guy who invented the web at CERN some 25 years ago. Uh, and then he believed in open access. So he said, okay, there is this public access to court electronic records in the US. But if it's public, it should be really public. So he just downloaded, you know, like bulk download of 20% of all the records and then published them. And this, in principle, it should be fine, but it was not fine for, for authorities. So there were some legal proceedings and so on. Similar case, at MIT in 2011, he downloaded a lot of, a lot of articles and then wanted to publish them because believed, he believed uh, that, you know, access to results of research that was funded publicly with public funds, those results should also be public. You know, you may argue whether he's right or wrong, but there is some logic, at least in it. Uh, but okay, again, even MIT said we will not, uh, you know, do anything against this guy, but the authorities actually started some proceedings and he was, you know, this was in the middle of the process. Uh, unfortunately, it resulted in him become, uh, committing suicide in 2013, in January, just to show you different types of people and different types of motivations and different outcomes. And then we have governments. Well, uh, governments also do use computers to do things they always were doing. So espionage, controlling people, uh, well, maybe eventually cyber, cyber war. And this may be you know, both countries that you would say, yes, they have fully right to do that, and countries that you would really not like to do that. I mean, it's, you know, then I don't want to go into politics. Uh, I'm just saying that different countries uh, like Syria was, uh, you know, using um, malware to infect computers of activists and to know who they communicate with. Um, German police uh, is infecting computers of criminals to gather evidence. U.S., as you know, uh, is at least accused of, of having th those programs for mass online surveillance, surveillance uh, you know, data collection, so all of, of, of the communication, not only Americans, but pretty much worldwide, of uh, well, email communication, phone communication, um, maybe Skype communication, uh, at least metadata, so at least information who contacted whom, when, and so on. This is already very valuable information. And this is already, my, in my personal opinion, if this is true, I don't know, but if this is true, it is affecting my privacy. Some other reports they say they actually are even capable of actually seeing the content of the communication. So not only who mailed whom, but also what was the content of the email or phone conversation. I just want to you know, discuss one particular aspect of it. Uh, one, one argument which is often raised um, in this context is that uh, authorities say, well, if you are doing nothing wrong, then you shouldn't worry if you watch you. And okay, there is some maybe logic. I personally don't believe in that particular argument. For me, if I'm, do, you know, sorry for a stupid example, but if I go to a toilet, I'm doing nothing wrong, but I don't want to be watched. Uh, and it's, it's, I would say more generally, privacy, you know, if I'm doing nothing wrong, then you shouldn't be watching me. Privacy, so being, having this comfort of, of not being watched, of not, you know, being, maybe data about you collected, I would say this is a, you know, something that humans, uh, is, this is a human right for me, I would say. And if you're worried about this particular programs in any way, in general, it is believed that encryption, cryptography, so like for example, HTTPS protocol, at the end of the HTTP in the URL, is still a good defense. So it is, it is believed by cryptographers, by security researchers, that whatever, you know, those maybe NSA in the US or some other agencies do in terms of mass uh, surveillance, it is believed that uh, you know, cryptography is still a good defense, so encrypting your, your things. And of course, otherwise, you know, governments, and they, you know, they do prepare for, cyber, well, cyber war is a, is a word which is maybe abused a bit, but for some kind of cyber activities uh, you know, between maybe countries, 
um, both defense and offense. So this is you know a public uh, job description, job you know uh, the, yeah, job description from NSA, uh, so National Security Agency in the U.S., which uh, which basically looks for uh, for some computer network operator who would be doing network defense, network attack, and computer ex network exploitation. These are not your average computer science or engineering jobs. Well, they are not. I mean, usually you don't hack. Um, and sorry. And this applies. I mean, many many countries uh, do uh, similar things. Again, I'm not even saying this is bad. I'm just reporting you what what is the reality these days. But there are some effects of it. So. You may have heard about Stuxnet, which is a worm that targeted Iranian uranium enriching centrifuges. It was discovered in 2010, but it was, you know, life uh, infecting uranium things, you know, several years uh, earlier. It is a big piece of software, where malicious software, so malware. Ten many years estimated development effort. So result is sabotage. So many computers infected and hardware damage, most importantly for, you know, uh, interestingly, so which means the centrifuges were basically broken because of this worm, and nu uh, Iranian nuclear program was set back by, uh, you know, approximately two years estimated. Now, who was behind? One way of looking at this is uh, asking who profits. So you may have your guesses. And then uh, last year, uh, New York Times published an article, you know, it's a serious uh, newspaper, who said basically it was a joint U.S.-Israeli operation. Um, yeah. Now, you may again believe that this was good or wrong. For me, a side effect is that this worm leaked. Now, other, well, criminals have code of this worm. So they don't have to spend 10 many years to, to attack. So this worm was targeted at some special type of hardware, uh, you know, control system controlling centrifuges. But now, if you change the payload but use the same worm and you, you just want to attack whatever else, you just take the whole code of those 10, you know, result of those 10 many years, you just change the damage it's supposed to do and you attack something else. And it's very, very hard to control this, you see? I mean, now it's in the wild. Anyone can use it and attack anyone else. And this is worrying. And this is kind of what, what uh, I mean, there are several trends that I may say I see ahead. One of them is exactly this. I mean, does Stuxnet, so this war, make us more vulnerable in the future? Uh, there are, you know, opinions vary. There are different people working on security. Some people say benefits are great and the risks exit anyway, exists. Uh, some other place, people say, well, this is a Pandora box. We will regret opening. Or why attack when we cannot defend, right? Because maybe U.S. and Israeli are actually more vulnerable to this kind of soft, mal malicious software worm that they just, you know, released, at least according to this article. Well, other trends, uh, you know, it's very hard to predict, especially the future. Uh, I believe what was said here, so the fact that we depend more and more or on digital life and then that the, our data, digital data, is more and more, not even with us, but remotely in some computer centers and maybe different legislations, um, this will be a tr well, trend that grows, and this brings risk that we discussed, and they will not disappear. The fact that we use more and more mobile well, devices, so, so, so smartphones, tablets, uh, they, will, they, are all, they are already, and they will be attacked more and more, unfortunately. Uh, like we had you know, viruses in the 90s on computers, we will have the same uh, on, on you know, mobile devices. And... Uh, well, I would like to say something very positive. Well, in general, there is research to make it, you know, to, to stop the crime and efforts, both technical and, and operational, but it's not getting better. It's not getting better, unfortunately. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer a couple of questions if you have time. I don't know. Yeah. Please, you have a microphone there. Yeah? If you press. If you don't mind, if you don't mind, I would like to ask two of two of the questions. If Go ahead. Okay. You already a little bit touched on the first one, which is the Stuxnet worm. Uh, from that worm, which detected, uh, if I'm correct, some SCADA systems in Iran, which are closed propri proprietary systems produced by. Siemens or something like that. That's right. Yeah. And more recently, China attacking uh, U.S. Were they water plants or something like that? Uh, mm -hmm. And now, 
considering that you are coming from a more or less industrial IT environment. Okay, uh, yeah. Well, which more, is kind of... unlike these systems that were compromised, open source. Mm -hmm. uh, would you claim that open source industrial systems are more secure than the closed ones? like the ones being compromised? Okay, interesting question. I, I would even say this, this is the same as question whether in general open source is more secure than proprietary closed source software because it's pretty much the same answer. A question and I would say for me the same answer. Okay, there is no answer. I mean, uh, in general, I would slightly trust more open source, but not necessarily much more. Just the fact that you write some software even with a, in a big group of people and you release it open source, which means public and people can look at the code and, you know, it doesn't mean that people actually will look into the code and will look for vulnerabilities. I would rather trust things which are established and which were, you know, attacked in the past and maybe even successfully and when people eventually couldn't, you know, attack. So, an example, a web server like Apache web server which is open source, now I trust it because it's there for many years and many people have the had the motivation over years to attack it so if there were, sim maybe there are still vulnerabilities, but if there were basic security holes, they were certainly already attacked and then discovered and they fixed. But the same applies to closed source. So, yeah? And uh, the second question is concerning the quantum computing. Uh, I come from networking industry and in corporate environment, uh, the top most secure technology that we can use is VPNs. IPsec. Is what, sorry? VPNs, yeah, okay. IPsec and uh, 256-bit uh, AES encryption. Yeah. Okay. Now with uh, quantum computing, uh, would it be possible, hypothetically of course, uh, for a government organization or someone with much more money than a corporate organization uh, to use the quantum computer to decrypt this type of encryption in real time basically? Okay, so the question, yeah, uh, okay, quantum computing is more a theoretical concept, so still, still, rather than anything, you know, practical and implemented. Now, there are many cryptographers who say, so behind, you know, what protects cryptographic algorithms, or more particularly encryption algorithms, is some math, maths, mathematics, you know, rules. So we believe that, for example, it's very hard to find integrals, you know, you know find something uh, for, for a number, you know, things that multiplied get this number. Uh, now, and prime numbers that, you know, multiplied arrive to a given number, uh, result in a number. Now, indeed, if what people foresee how quantum computing could work, uh, if this is true, then indeed some maths will be much easier to solve, much, much faster, which means some algorithms will break. And in particular, it is, but if, it's a big if, uh, if so if quantum computing uh, is there, Cryptographers believe that asymmetric algorithms, so public-private key algorithms, um, will or may be broken. And they believe symmetric uh, encryption algorithms, such as, for example, this, are more secure. Anyway, it's, I would say it's far from now. Yeah. This? No, Jacek Gajewski from Poland also. So, I would say the many countries, they simply do have cyber war departments, yeah, or units of army. Our they do. Polish army also has it. <laughs> so, uh, the fact of some algorithms of attacking will be developed. The question is, do we, have, do we need any convention to use it, to limit, like with chemical weapons or uh, atomic weapons? That's one thing. And the other thing is, uh, I've been quite a lot involved in organizing CERTs also in NATO context. We do need a kind of a mutual cyber defense uh, treaty. It's also not existing and not really anything is done into the, in, this, in this direction. So that will happen also by the by the government development, and you are very right to say that 
the same like any every other weapons. If these weapons leak to the <laughs> criminals, then we have a disaster. Well, the it's same a, with guns or, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah? Or same with nuclear weapon if it leaks or a chemical. You may be actually much more knowledgeable in this topic than me, <laughs> but I can share my, my understanding. Uh, well, like, okay, with nuclear weapon, how it worked. First, well, you know the history. US uh, dropped two bombs over Japan. And then the two big powers, so uh, Soviet Russia and US, basically both developed big, very big uh, offense capacities. But both knew that if whoever starts, you know, they will bomb each other completely. So there was this concept of, I think it's called mutual deterrence, right? So both main involved parties knew that it's not in their interest to start anything. Uh, also because it's the attribution, so knowing who attacked is relati or was relatively easy. I mean, if there is you know, a nuclear uh, rocket, uh, bomb you know, or, or you know, m missile uh, landing in uh, New York, you can, you, uh, you know, let's say in the 50s, you could assume this is Russians, or you, and you, you could be pretty much right. How fortunately never happens. Uh, now, with cybercrime, it's a bit more tricky because it's very hard to attribute, or well, very, well, it's very hard to prove where things came from. So, you know, U.S. regularly accuses China, and actually China, you know, official, um, well, entities, agencies, of doing, you know, mass-scale espionage, industrial espionage over U.S. companies. And China says, this is not true. This is other attackers who use Chinese IP addresses to attack so that it looks like a Chinese attack. Again, you may have your opinion uh, on this, but proving is very hard. Which means, you know, so, and, and then also leaking, you know, uh, weapons. So it's, you know, you know exactly how many nuclear bombs you have. And of course you may lose one, well, hopefully not, but I mean, you know, it's a physical object which is protected and so on. Source code of an attack, of a vulnerable, you know, of an of a attack tool, you may copy it thousands of times, no one will even realize. So as, as soon as it leaks, it leaked. So there are some similarities, there are some, you know, other problems. Any other questions? Uh, recently, there was attack from Swedish, I think, schoolboy. There, oh, sorry. Attack from Swedish schoolboy uh, over Google, attacking some a site servicing. Uh, I don't remember the name of the company. Yeah. So this company fell, and then as a result, everything fell for a few hours. So, uh, do you think such a large structure like CERN IT structure? who uses outside services. If some of these services attack them, stop. How dangerous is for the main structure? Not direct attack, but attack. You mean for the networking infrastructure? For the network, or? yes. Yeah. OK, I don't really, really know details, or details of how networking is you know, done. But in terms, at least in terms of networking, we have multiple links through multiple redundant you know, connections. Uh, so of course, think you know connections may you know or some parts of infrastructure may may stop or break because of different things, either attack or some physical you know a uh, digger you know just cuts the fiber cable or whatever other reasons. But okay, there is redundancy. Or do you mean more like attacks to computing services or net yeah network? So I would say redundancy is already one very good uh, approach. Please. Um, how it's possible to attack um, using cyber crime the the facilities of nuclear research or uh, any nuclear facilities while even though these facilities are not connected to the internet anyway because they have their own kind of um, network or internet is really close to them even if you go to what any big company here or even mid companies Novartis, whatever, you will find them like having their own um, system of the web of communications, even the uh, governments and so, so how, how cyber crime is possible on the nuclear facilities? Uh, I, I will maybe answer a slightly more general question. Uh, so in, indeed, if you want to protect something, uh, these days you just, want to, you just disconnect it from internet. That's, you know, that's a very good way. Now, of course, if you disconnect it, you probably lose most of the things that you want to do. Uh, so, but okay, if you want to protect, uh, for example, control systems, even here at CERN, we do control accelerator and, and detectors with 
computer systems. So, uh, so with you know computers with software and so on. But the the network that this computers or software are working uh, running is disconnected from the well from the general purpose network and therefore from the internet. Now it's disconnected, but there are always some links. I mean, there have to be, or in most cases, there have to be. And the more complex the system is. Uh, you know, a network at CERN, or certainly networks in even you know in well-protected companies, banks, or or nuclear power plants, or some you know military research institutes. There is not a, there is no such thing as fully well-protected uh, system. Unfortunately, complexity makes it extremely hard to protect things. And then, even if you say, okay, I will never, I have this computer, and I will never connect it to you know physically any cable or wireless to to network, you still want to maybe transfer data. So you will say, okay, I just use a USB stick. Right to transfer data between my computer, which is disconnected, and some other computers which are, co which are connected. Now, modern malware, so this is, for example, what activists do, you know, uh, Tibet Tibetan rights activists, or maybe Tibetan government in uh, Jaramsala in India. And then, a few years ago, there was a worm that was discovered on these computers, the computers that were disconnected, and this worm was clever enough to steal, well, to steal data or documents from the computers which were disconnected, and as soon as someone was connecting a USB key and you know, connecting to that computer, then documents were, in a hidden way, copied to that key. And as soon as the same USB key was connected to any computer on the internet, well, the documents made their way to whoever was you know, attacking. So basically, it's a, it's a constant game of you know, att attack and defense. Uh, it's a kind of arm race, and it kind of depends how much uh, money you want or how much resources, which means eventually money you want to spend on attacking and defending. So depending on how much you are likely to attack, what are your risks, what are, you know, what are your risks, you have to spend less or more on protecting yourselves. And of course, the more you spend, the, the more better you protect it, but there is no total security. Does this answer the question more or less? Yeah. Okay, any? And other questions? Well, thank you very, very much for, for your questions, for your attention.